Toyota's fuel cell technology just keeps getting better. We're going to talk about the benefits of their newly developed third gen fuel cell system today. I'm not that excited about it, but it's worth talking about. And it, fuel cell always gets people fired up one way or the other. But we're also gonna talk a little bit about Mazda, what they're doing on the other side of the world. Meanwhile, here in the United States, it's a bit slow going for new product. And then at the end, we're gonna talk about Kia's new EV4 sedan and EV4 hatchback. The hatchback was the big surprise here. I can't wait to talk about the design of that. So let's make sure you're buckled in and stay till the end for all that good stuff. Guys, if you're new to the channel, my name's Kirk. I talk about automotive news. If you enjoy that, make sure you're subscribed. And um, if you would like hydrogen to be more widely available to fill up a potential hydrogen car in the future, I don't know, hit the like button. Toyota announced today their new fuel cell system, third gen. This is now on par with conventional diesel engines for durability. So hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles of longevity. The new system features significant improvements in performance, including fuel efficiency and significant reduction in cost compared to the prior version. More efficient, cheaper, more range. Great. This third gen system, they're still developing for passenger vehicles. If you haven't watched my previous driving impressions and reviews on the Toyota Mirai, go ahead and check that out. Uh, but of course, this will be expanded for heavy use in heavy duty commercial vehicles. In today's environment where there's just a lack of hydrogen fueling stations, it would make sense to invest more heavily in these systems as commercial vehicles. Uh, where you don't need as many charging stations or should I say refilling stations. Um, and you can have a more strategically laid out uh, in highway situations, all right? It just doesn't make, in my opinion, it doesn't make much sense for passenger vehicles unless you can produce your own hydrogen at home, which no one's doing that I'm aware of. And so that's why it's just it has such a hard battle against battery electrics right now, or even gasoline, just due to availability of electricity and availability of gasoline. All right. So availability of your fuel source, your energy source is vital for convenient propulsion, convenient locomotion, and it just doesn't exist in today's environment. But it's good that they're still working on it because maybe one day, maybe one day we'll have so much abundant energy. We'll have cold fusion. We'll have so much abundant energy through all sorts of different means. And then, and then hydrogen production can be uh, done at a massive scale to store energy. It's two times more durable than the previous generation. Uh, now on par with diesels, but there's no maintenance. Improvement in fuel efficiency is 20% better than the prior generation, which gives us 20% better cruising range. Uh, that's something that hydrogen does better with than BEVs. Uh, Mirai's range, I know there's BEVs that go further than this, uh, but for example, the Mirai can do about 400 miles of range. Now, 20% more than that. So you get an extra 80 miles here. So you're talking about about 500 miles of peak range here now on a vehicle like the Mirai. But we're gonna move on to something more tangible, at least in certain markets. Uh, Mazda just had this big announcement. Uh, establishing a production system with 100,000 units of annual capacity for new compact SUVs Introducing five models in the Thai market by 2027. Are we going to see any of these markets or any of these SUVs for the Thai market exported into the United States? And I would say the chances are slim to none. This is what's really heartbreaking. But hopefully, I mean, here's the thing: Mazda, they just shot their shot their shot with their big platform vehicles, the CX90 and the CX70 here in the United States. Seems like any new product now, it's going to be in the CX-5 and the CX-5 hybrid. And then I don't really know anything after that. Of course, there's the rumors about a sports sedan or sports uh, coupe, depending on which route they could go in, uh, in development with the Toyota Supra with the inline six. But I mean, this though, this is real. This is happening. This is official. 
for Thailand. They're developing a manufacturing hub for these compact SUVs. What do we have for compact SUVs? Well, technically the CX-5 is a compact SUV. They're gonna keep making that in Japan, so that doesn't count. Uh, CX-50 will continue to be made in the United States. What about the CX-30? Well, CX-30 is made um, in Japan. It's also made in Mexico. So I don't see, unless they start producing the CX, uh, redesigned CX-30 as well, um, in Thailand, which is a possibility. So they're gonna have 100,000 units uh, leveraging the local supply chain and they'll reinforce the plant's roles and export base focus though. So when I saw export base, I'm like, yes, maybe someone will come to the United States. No, because it's focused on Japan and uh, the Southeast Asian and um, Australia markets and Oceania, for example, all right, which is expected to grow steadily and will strengthen sales in the Thai market where Mazda has been present for the past 70 years. So in the next two years, from 25 to 27, they plan to introduce a total of five models, two BEVs, okay? We have, well, what's crazy, I was gonna say we have zero BEVs from Mazda in the United States for now. They had the MX-30 BEV stateside. I saw one on the road like last week here in Florida. I'm like, wh where did this thing come from? So crazy, 100 miles of range. Anyways, one plug-in hybrid. Um, we have two plug-in hybrids, technically one because the CX-7 and CX-9 are the same vehicle. Uh, and two hybrids. Well, we have, uh, besides the CX-50 hybrid, which uses Toyota's hybrid system, we have zero hybrids zero Mazda hybrids here in the United States that are Mazda hybrid technology, not counting the plug-in hybrids, right? That's interesting that the Thai market is seemingly more uh, advanced than the United States market with electrification. I mean, we just saw that Nissan's closing a plant there like in the next few months. They can't keep, they can't, uh, they can't compete with the, the, the Chinese success down there in Southeast Asia. Um, let's see here. They're also going to be introducing this vehicle, which I would love to have. Um, this is the C sorry, Mazda six E, um, in other markets it's called the EZ six in Japan. This is sorry in China, which I think it's going to be brought into Japan. This, this sedan gorgeous, uh, inside and out. It is a uh, fully battery electric for some markets. In China, they have a, a range extended version of it. It's of course, co-developed uh, with Chang'an Mazda or Chang'an Automotive, which is a Chinese automaker. So that's never gonna come to the United States with the tariffs we have here. So anyways, let's get onto the design, the official design of the EV4. Now. It's not going to stop here because EV Day is coming for um, for Kia here in Tarago Tara Tarragona, Spain, on February 24th, where the EV4 will make its debut. Now, it's also going to make its debut, its official debut, even though we got the designs. It's going to make its official debut alongside of a couple other vehicles. But then you also have this teaser here. This is of the EV2. I don't think it's coming to America. Uh, but this has been seen uh, testing in the United States, the PV5. Um, the EV9 from Kia is a fantastic EV for a three row. It's one of my favorite EVs actually. And it's a much better vehicle, in my opinion, than the Kia Carnival uh, that I've been driving this week. And I'm like, man, if only the, if we had Kia's excellent uh, EV driving, one pedal driving um, and its overall refinement in a minivan, I would much rather have it over the Carnival. The Carnival hybrid specifically, the braking doesn't feel to, uh, refined or even seemingly worked on at all. It's, it's very, very sketch in my opinion. And that's the main thing that detracts for me from, from wanting one because, hey, 37 miles per gallon they got in it was great. But hey, I would much rather have this PV5 um, and I don't know, the name is a bit silly for me, PV5. So let's get into the designs of the EV4. All right. Um, I always thought be, out after they came out with the concept of the LA Auto Show a few years back, I always thought it was pretty ugly. This doesn't look much different than the concept at all. The front here looks fine. And then you get to the back area and it looks like it was just like, Legoed on or pasted on. It doesn't look cohesive. 
necessarily with the window lines. It just looks really, really strange to me. And then from this design as well, like the hips, it just looks really dorky in the back, um, like a baboon's butt sticking out or something. Now there's a GT line. So if we look at the design here, very vertical focused. And then you have this, it kind of reminds me how uh, like the Prius kind of has like this bar that goes across. Um, but if we go to the EGT line, honestly, I don't think of like the lights look the same to me. Um, and it doesn't look that much sportier. Maybe the wheels look sportier. They have not really, they both have 19 inch wheels. Now this was the big surprise. The, the reveal of this. Now it looks the same from the front. Here's a GT line wagon or the five door. Look at this from the back. Everything that's funky about this is fixed with this. And I'm so glad that they brought a wagon to the market. Um, I know the EV6 is kind of wagony, but this is gonna be a more affordable EV. Um, and you go from this with how weird it looks back here to this, which the proportions are are dead on, all right? Which reminds me also of the Kia K4. The K4 sedan looks okay. There's nothing wrong with it, but the K4 hatchback looks even better. And that's definitely what's going on here with the EV4 GT line. I'm excited. I'm excited to see because in just a few days, what, February 27th, 10 days from now, when, when these are officially unveiled, I'm excited to see what kind of range and power these things are gonna have. Uh, we don't know those details quite yet. All we know is that it's probably going to be 400 volt architecture, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, whereas, like the EV6, for example, and the EV9, and that's 800 volt architecture, which charges a lot faster. Uh, so I'm I'm excited to see what Kia can offer on the more affordable EVs. But I'm going to end it there. Uh, I'm excited for this wagon. I'm excited to see what Mazda has in store for Southeast Asia. And excited, not really excited, uh, because I know it's it's not they're not going to come here. Um, and then Toyota's fuel cell next gen system, I'm sure it's amazing, I'm sure it's great. Uh, the problem is we don't have a uh, you know hydrogen fuel cell or hydrogen fueling stations anywhere in the United States. Uh, maybe a couple of places in California or something. So shut it down. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you uh, next time. Also stay tuned today. I need to review the Honda Pilot that I've been driving this week. So I'll have a driving review on that coming soon. Catch you in the next one in peace.